Good morning. A year has passed and um, I am improving on the last year's edition of this course. So uh, all the illustrations are now integrated into the video. You can still see the presentation without the video on Moodle, uh, but now it's more integrated. Also the links and quizzes that uh, uh, the students received last year in email are now on Moodle. So there is a forum section with extra materials. I hope you are uh, quite familiar with the system by now. So uh, you can find the links to the videos. Uh, you can also do the quizzes online. And uh, this week's uh, quiz will also include the, uh, the documentary, a three-part BBC documentary um, titled Bought with Love, The Secret History of British Art Collections. Uh, this was made in 2013 um, by um, art historian Helen Roslin. Very interesting. Uh, I hope you can still find it uh, online. There is a link in Moodle. So this is something I would like to add uh, to, uh, to this week. Uh, and I strongly suggest you watch, you watch the whole thing. You watch the three episodes. They are very interesting. And of course, they will uh, provide you with a lot of visual materials concerning both the paintings and also um, a lot of interesting architecture, the, uh, the residences of the, uh, of the people who, uh, who actually made Britain interested in the arts. So uh, we need to step back a little uh, to the uh, times of the Stuart dynasty. Uh, I mentioned it uh, when we talked about the Stuarts, but uh, now we can add to that a little. So the first, uh, the first episode is about the 17th century, uh, the uh, court of uh, uh, of. Uh, Charles I and uh, the aristocrats from this period, so the uh, 17th century, uh, who really started to bring Britain closer um, to, to the European art and especially to the art of, of the Italian great, great old masters uh, of the Renaissance. And uh, the, um, the people to remember here uh, are um, the Earl of Arundel and his wife, so the Arundels. Uh, they are credited uh, as uh, uh, the first uh, serious art collectors in Britain. Uh, they probably introduced the tradition of the Grand Tour to Italy. Uh, you have to remember this is after the Tudors and the break with Roman Catholic Church. So uh, during um, the uh, reign of the later reign of uh, Henry VIII and then uh, the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, uh, this was practically unheard of for the British people to travel to Italy, to travel to Rome and other uh, cities of, um, of Italy. Uh, this appears again as a cultural fashion which will catch on tremendously and by the 18th century anybody who was anybody would be traveling to Italy for a grand tour. But according to this documentary, it starts with the Arundels uh, who wanted to, uh, to explore Italy, to look for beautiful artwork to decorate uh, uh, their, uh, their residence, Arundel Castle, one of the uh, best preserved and uh, most beautiful castles in the south of England. And uh, there were other people, of course, not only uh, the Arundels, although the Arundels, uh, they were best friends of Inigo Jones. They traveled to Venice before it was fashionable. Uh, they could be credited for starting the whole fashion for art collecting at the court of, um, of Charles I, James I, Charles I. Um, 
in a slightly later period when James I died and was replaced by his son Charles, they started having, let's say, rivals, other rich noblemen uh, who, uh, who engaged in collecting art. Uh, probably the greatest rival of the Earl of Arundel was the Duke of Buckingham, one of the favourites of um, King Charles uh, I. Uh, um, he had more money, he would buy more splendid, flashy uh, pictures, uh, uh, all the Titians and Tintorettos and all the, uh, the great stuff like that. Whereas the Arundels uh, were probably more sophisticated and uh, their tastes were perhaps not so flashy as uh, uh, definitely uh, the Duke of Buckingham. For example, the Earl of Arundel bought a large collection of Leonardo's drawings. So something that you wouldn't really put on a wall because they were too delicate and uh, um, they could uh, actually fade in contact with, uh, with sunlight. Uh, and nobody really collected drawings, even of great masters such as Leonardo. He was the first one. Now they are in the royal collection. So um, this was really something that, uh, that he started. Um, the rivalry ended when uh, the Duke of Buckingham was assassinated by a soldier, a disgruntled soldier after some sort of failed military campaign. But the, uh, the tradition of the Grand Tour to Italy really started and everybody went there. Um, the king uh, invited uh, great artists, we talked about it, Van Dyck, Apparently he was first invited by the Earl of Arundel and then he got the royal commissions. Uh, Rubens, who travelled to, uh, to Britain, who worked for the British court, uh, for example, um, decorating the banqueting house at the Palace of Whitehall. And generally the courtiers of Charles I start to collect art to win favor with the king, to basically be important at court. Uh, there is a, a, an informal club of aristocratic art collectors called the Whitehall Circle because they were all uh, surrounded, they all surrounded the, um, the king. Uh, so, um, of course, with the um, uh, with the outbreak of the Civil War, it all stops and uh, Oliver Cromwell and his government start to sell out a lot of the royal collection. We talked about it uh, uh, when we talked about the Stuarts and then it all returns with the restoration. And we have uh, more people, more families really, um, involved in art collecting. So uh, the, um, the Arundels, they, they, had to, uh, they had to go to exile during the civil war and they basically uh, were even forced to start selling some of the, of the artwork uh, that they possessed. But after the restoration, there are more and more such aristocratic couples usually who are interested in collecting art, such as the Exeters, the owners of Burghley House in Lincolnshire, the house that you may remember from our talk of the Tudor period, because the, um, the palace itself was built to impress Queen Elizabeth the first, but later in the 1670s, the new owners, the Exeters, used it to house their splendid collection of art, and they even followed the royal example of, of uh, inviting foreign artists, such, such as an, uh, an Italian painter, Antonio Verio, to decorate the inside of the house. You can see uh, in, the, in the documentary, you can see the beautiful staircase with splendid decoration, with some sort of illusionistic paintings, and uh, it's really, uh, it's really quite, um, quite impressive. So the first 
episode was about the 17th century, the Stuarts, and then they move into the 18th century in the second episode and uh, that's why I decided to wait with this documentary until the 18th century because according to Helen Roslin at least, this is the golden age of art collections in, uh, in Britain, the 18th century, not the 17th, not even the 19th, although of course the, uh, the passion for collecting art and for establishing museums um, continues, but it is the 18th century that really has uh, the uh, tradition of uh, the grand tour to Italy in full swing with some new fashions like uh, in the early 18th century most uh, uh, cultured travelers would go to Rome, then Venice becomes popular again, then for a time Florence becomes popular again. So this is what, uh, what really becomes a very popular way to add to your education really. Uh, we have some more uh, collectors like the Earl of, Bur of Burlington who had the nickname Apollo of the Arts because he, he traveled so much, he collected so much, he had this kind of Italian style villa um, built to house his collection uh, and we basically have lots of people uh, collecting the uh, European art, first class art, sometimes uh, more, I would say, uh, contemporary, so not only the Titians and the Leonardos, but there is a great fashion, for example, for Claude Lorraine, a French uh, painter who specialized in some sort of um, fantastic landscape. So this is this is really the beginning of the interest in landscape painting that will become so popular in the later in the later 18th century and of course in the 19th century. This starts with those collections with the interest in Claude Lorraine. Uh, for example by the Earl of Leicester Thomas Cook uh, for Holkham Hall in Norfolk. Uh, there are clubs of art lovers. Uh, the most important one in the 18th century is called the Society of Dilettanti. Dilettanti is, a, is an Italian word meaning the lovers of art, the lovers of beauty. So uh, now it sounds a little bit pejorative. A dilettante is someone who is a, an amateur pre pretending to be, um, let's say, a professional. But in the 18th century, this was taken in good measure. So these were the art lovers, the beauty lovers, and of course by art they meant Italian art. So m lots of people go to Venice, they start buying contemporary art from living artists, uh, like uh, Canaletto, the city views of Canaletto, the, like, like souvenirs, the visual records of their trip. They do not have photography yet of course, so if they want a souvenir of their trip to Venice, they would go to the studio of Canaletto and buy one of his beautiful cityscapes. There would even be a special English agent working with Canaletto to secure his uh, English commissions and uh, uh, facilitate the sale of his paintings. Uh, then the war of Austrian succession happens in the 18th century, so uh, there are some, I would say, technical and formal problems with the English people going to Italy, but Canaletto is invited to England. He is invited to London by, by one of those uh, great aristocrats, Charles Lennox, uh, Duke of Richmond. Actually, his father was uh, the, uh, one of the uh, illegitimate sons of Charles II the Merry Monarch, if you remember him. So this is, this is the grandson of the king, um, the owner of uh, one of the great residences in Sussex called Goodwood. So he would invite Canaletto to London and commission um, the cityscapes. So this is really, again, the next step 
towards the great passion of the English art with landscapes, so something that we will talk about uh, very soon. Uh, the son of the Duke of Richmond, the next Duke of Richmond, the third Duke of Richmond actually, uh, starts, uh, well, actually to follow in his father's footsteps and uh, uh, his uh, grand tour of course involves Italy but there are new things as well. He stops in Holland in the Netherlands for a time to do a course of anatomy. He studies medicine and anatomy there and uh, being a country gentleman so having a splendid country residence he becomes interested in something we have talked about this week. So animals, country sports. So he becomes the third Duke of Richmond, becomes the sponsor and, uh, and uh, uh, the main protector of George Stubbs. So this English painter who specializes in horses, who specializes in country, residences and country scenes, uh, he actually started his career by studying the anatomy of the horse. He even published a very important and respected book on the subject, The Anatomy of the Horse. But then he has the splendid artistic career. So the, um, the popularity of art collecting and traveling to Italy and uh, buying art, inviting artists, starts to influence the development of British art as well, especially in the 18th century. And this results in another aspect of artistic life, which we mentioned this week, namely the establishment of the Royal Academy of Arts in the 18th century. Um, this is the time, this is, this is mentioned many times during this documentary, there was the time bef before national art schools, before public galleries, so people didn't know the great masters of art. Uh, I mentioned already if you wanted to become an artist you had to become an apprentice, but if you wanted to see the works of Grand Masters, the only thing you could do was actually visit one of those great houses which housed the collections. So, um, of course, some owners of these art collections uh, allowed the visitors in. Uh, sometimes they even invited art students to stay uh, as guests in the, uh, in the um, country houses, to um, study there, to paint there, um, but uh, the uh, establishment of the Royal Academy of Arts really changed the scene. There was this national art school with a lot of emphasis put on uh, humanist training but also on learning the craft. For example, uh, this was one of the very few places in which students could sketch from life models also in the nude, so naked models were employed uh, to, uh, to pose for sketches. Uh, there were annual exhibitions which allowed the art market to develop, so um, artists could display their paintings. This is very interesting and you, ha you have a lot of visual materials. Actually, the paintings showing the annual exhibition of the uh, of the Royal Academy and it's completely different system than what you can find in art museums and art galleries today because uh, in the 18th century when you had an art exhibition the entire area of the walls would be covered with paintings from the floor to the ceiling and of course the point was to have your painting as an artist displayed in a good position not too high and not too low and of course if you had good reputation if you had rich sponsors um, 
your positioning during the exhibitions was better. Uh, so we have those open houses I mentioned already and uh, uh, this really um, profits the, the um, artistic world uh, in Britain. Uh, one of the people they mention is the Earl of Egremont and his, uh, uh, his residence, his house called Petworth and the wonderful cooperation and you even might say friendship he has with Turner one of the greatest landscape paint painters of the early uh, 19th century as a young artist he visited Petworth he uh, um, produced some of his uh, early work there which the Earl of Egremont uh, displayed in the um, in the rooms uh, next to Holbein's and Van Dyck's and other uh, other uh, great um, works in the 19th century the third uh, the third episode is about the 19th century starting with the Regency period so a step forward from what we are discussing now in the course but we will get there and there are some interesting things to notice even now for example in 1824 so quite a long while before Queen Victoria's accession in the period which you can still refer to as Regency a kind of long Regency um, the uh, National Gallery is established in London. This is a new idea, uh, partially uh, because uh, uh, the French Revolution uh, caused uh, many of the French collections to be sold uh, and uh, you have a lot of um, uh, British aristocrats buying the uh, the French uh, art from the French collections. It could be Italian art just as well because the um, French aristocrats uh, uh, collected art even before the British. Uh, the most important collection to come uh, to, uh, to be sold was the collection of the Duke of Orleans, the Orleans collection and uh, even a special syndicate, a special partnership was formed between, uh, among three English noblemen, uh, the Earl of Carlisle, the owner of Castle Howard, one of the wonderful residences with the splendid art collection. So the Earl of Carlisle, um, Lord Gower, the former ambassador in France and Lord Bridgewater who was a very rich uh, um, aristocrat he enriched himself on canal buildings we mentioned this a little bit in the previous uh, uh, in the previous part so the development the very beginning of the industrial Re revolution the construction of the canals the engineering people like Thomas Telford uh, so Lord Bridgewater was one of the aristocrats who sponsored building canals and who gained a lot of money in this way so he could add to this syndicate it was even called after him the Bridgewater syndicate so these three noblemen bought most of the Orleans collection but increasingly there was this kind of patriotic feeling that people should not keep those beautiful artworks in their own private residences. Some uh, noblemen tried to open private galleries uh, but uh, soon enough there was this consensus that it was a very patriotic thing to do to establish the National Gallery and it was opened in 1824 with the majority of works actually donated given or at least loaned by private collectors so uh, this was an incredible thing a very patriotic thing to do after the wars with France uh, with the development of um, the cities 
with London becoming basically a modern city, with the middle class growing, uh, with uh, the education growing, uh, with the great reform bill adding more and more um, uh, people, let's say, giving the, the right to vote to more people from the middle class. The belief that education and art appreciation as a very important part of education is something that the, nob that the, the nobility should engage in. And uh, it was like a snowball effect. One nobleman gave a few paintings from his pers personal collection and others followed. So uh, basically this was a massive success. And then later in the 19th century we have those great art exhibitions and museums private galleries formed also by the people coming from the middle class. So uh, three examples, I don't want to speak too much about the 19th century now, but three very important examples from the documentary. One is the Manchester Art Show uh, in 1857. So this is the middle of the 19th century. Manchester is one of the most industrialized cities in Britain. And the um, industrialists, bankers, and basically business people from the rich middle class uh, organized a massive art show with mostly loans from private collections. And this is a great success. We have some old masters, so old Italian and French painters, but we have a lot of modern British art, including things like the Pre-Raphaelites. We are going to talk about Pre-Raphaelites a lot, but this is the modern art in the middle of the 19th century, and it's hanging together with the old masters. This was a massive success. More than 1.3 million viewers coming to see the paintings. Uh, some other documentary by Jeremy Paxman that we are going to watch later on uh, calls the paintings the cinema of the 19th century. This, this was as popular as the cinema was in the 20th century. So we have um, the uh, Manchester Art Show and we have two more names perhaps which are worth remembering or maybe three. One is Thomas Holloway a private businessman coming from a relatively modest background. He was um, an apothecary. He was, uh, uh, he made a lot of money on selling medicine. Now probably we would call it quack medicine, some sort of pills and syrups that were supposed to cure everything. Uh, but uh, when he became a millionaire, one of the things he did was to sponsor to build uh, the Royal Holloway College in Surrey near London for women, for the education, for higher education of women. Now it's uh, um, co-educational but originally it was for women only with a splendid picture gallery with lots of modern British art. So I haven't been there. I really want to go there and, uh, and see this gallery. I love 19th century art and there are some wonderful examples here in Royal Holloway, Holloway College. Uh, there are lots of municipal art galleries. So most cities in Britain have their own art galleries. Uh, the Rothschilds, so the uh, banking family also uh, connect. And the last, uh, the last name, the Davis sisters. Uh, two sisters from Wales, from a middle class background who collect European art and especially the Impressionists. So yeah, this was half an hour um, covering the whole documentary. Watch it, just watch it and do the quiz and see you next week. Thank you.